Hello, Jim Tew here again with my monthly piece describing the article that will be out over in April of this year, 2020. Then the usual thing I do where I come up with a few disassociated topics that are of interest to me, I hope they are subsequently of interest to you. This month I, I wrote about an issue that I had with basically a sore throat and hoarseness that just persisted and persisted. It affected me at a couple of talks that I gave and was just more than a bit embarrassing and you kind of feel sorry for the participants. So my physician, trying to help me with this, had a beekeeping father for a while and he said, hey, why don't you take some honey? And I admitted that I'd always written about the medicinal values of honey and how it can be good for you at some time and other times not quite as certain. So I began to try to take honey. I didn't know how to do it. I went to the literature. I don't mean to offend anybody, but the literature wasn't exactly clear. Indeed, it was uh, confusing. So at first, I just took a whole teaspoon of honey. Well, that kind of overwhelmed me. I mean, I was overloaded with the goodness of honey. So I ended up just dipping the end of the spoon that I was taking the whole spoonful into the honey and taking that much more often instead of taking these big clumps all at one time. So I went through all that and found out a lot of things. If you, One thing I found out that writing about the goodness of honey for medicinal reasons is a lot different than having a medical issue that you want the honey to do something good for. So it wasn't exactly easy to get specific answers. I discussed some of that learned a lot. I always learn more for writing than I do for actually teaching anybody else anything. On a different note that I didn't mention in the article at all was that it's kind of hard to pour honey in the kitchen from a larger jar, like a quart jar, into a smaller container like some kind of honey server. But that's just complaining now. You could use funnels, you could do whatever. But honey is a sticky, sticky product, so you need to, or I need to take care when I'm transferring to a smaller jar. Just pour some in a smaller jar. Well, you go pour some in a smaller jar and see if this stuff doesn't string and run everywhere. You'll figure it out. I like to find things outside of beekeeping that could be useful in beekeeping. And I've dutifully written about a lot of these things. Right across the room is a Milwaukee heat gun. Now that brand name means nothing to you or to me. It's just the one I've got. But I found the heat gun to be a useful thing, but it was not manufactured for beekeeping and it's not sold for beekeeping. But for heating propolis, heating wax, doing a lot of things in beekeeping, that heat gun comes in really, really handy. So this month, I came up with a few queen cage options and something I've called beekeeping improvisations where we take stuff, things, scraps, parts, and make something that may have some beekeeping use. Not because we save money, not because some similar product is not in the beekeeping industry, but just because it's fun, it's clever, it makes me feel useful. So I described some of those. One of the things was the little tubes that goes on the end of cut flowers, specifically in my case, roses. Just a little vial with a hole with a little cap on it and a hole in it, and you stick the the stem through and it keeps the roses alive until you can get home with them or whatever. I'm not much of a cut flower person, so I'm not really sure what I'm talking about. Talked about some of those things. I made a queen cage one time that worked out well. I made one made it out of PVC scraps, and I dutifully lost it after I used it for about three years. Take about 10 minutes to make another one, but it's just so easy to find a queen cage or use a queen cage. But that little contrivance let me use a scrap of PVC for something it was not intended for to make a queen cage for. I've talked about it in the article. I, I need to have you go read that. I can't show it to you because it's long lost. I had to go back and study the literature in bee culture, apparently, and I wrote it in July of 2018. It's probably in the August of 2018 issue, which strangely was not on the previous issue 
presentation that Bee Culture Magazine offers, so I couldn't confirm that. I misspoke, and I don't have to admit this to you or to the readers, but I'm, I need to for me. I have a picture of a queen exposing what looks like a Nasanoff gland. I know she was a queen, and I know she held that intersegmental membrane open for a long minute. This was not an accident where she sneezed or something and that little membrane flashed and went away. No, she consciously held it open for over a minute. So I incorrectly, with a puzzlement at the time, I've never heard of the use of a queen's Nasanoff gland, but she's a bee. But it was haunting. Something's not right with this. I went ahead and published it and then... and. Uh, so oh, months later, I figured out that queens and drones don't have nice enough clans. I didn't figure it out. I read about it. So there was that picture boldly posted way back in 2018, a photo of me snapping a queen's nice enough gland. It was some membrane, but it, it's not that gland. The literature is just replete with citations and documentations that queens and drones don't have Nasanoff glands. Which leads me to the question, why? Why wouldn't they have Nasanoff glands? Why don't they need them? What did they restructure that little glandular uh, area for, if anything? So, solved one question, pictures wrong, came up with other questions. But along that line, this happens all the time. I, I wrote about, right behind these cameras set up, about a stack of supers I had there that I was going to extract sometime during the winter. And while I put it off, put it off, put it off, I wrote about this, I think, last month. I got a good case of wax moths and even some small hive beetles. So I set it outside, cold, that'll take care of you, freeze you right out because it was really cold. Well, in Ohio, it gets really cold and then it, usually warms up again and it did warm up again and the bees did take a cleansing flight and I noticed two bees out there sniffing around that equipment that was set outside but was exposed it was open they could get in it I noticed those two bees there within an hour two hours I noticed there were about 200 bees there and I noted to myself, and now I'm just telling you, you know, that round dance, that circle dance, whichever you call it, that just gives information, some odor, maybe some taste. It's within 10 meters of the colony. Did, did they use that information only to find this box that quickly? I mean, they're, they're 90 feet away. This was, I mean, they, that was a lot of, circular distance to cover, 90 feet around the colony, and pinpoint in on that box. So I just had the mental question, I'll bet you there's more to this dance thing than I've been told. There's an article now in a popular magazine, maybe Newsweek, not Newsweek, it may be Time, that reported some ja uh, Japanese work, I think Japanese work, that there are all kinds of issues. There's all kinds of dances, just not those two big ones. So I don't know what that means, except if something is written rigidly in beekeeping, you can tell the difference. And in this case, it was very specific. Numbers were given on what that round dance is good for. That there may be some wobble around that in ways we don't understand that it's not that rigid. I'm off the subject. I didn't write about any of this. I'm putting it out there because looks like it was a queen Nasanoff gland. She doesn't have a Nasanoff gland. Then what's she doing? I don't know. This question is not unusual. These questions are like this throughout the beekeeping world. And we just accept them at face value. And we give a beginning and an end to it. When in reality, there's a lot of room on both sides before you get to the beginning and to the end. Well, I hope you read the article. I've got some more things coming up on this improvisational area where beekeepers make things work that really had no business being in beekeeping. And as I find more and 
and the uh, mood strikes me, I'll include some more. Hey, appreciate you watching this, and I'm sorry for all the bells and whistles going off. This is just a short video for, for supporting the writing that I do. I thank you for watching. Some of you write me and tell me that you watched. <laughs> you write me two months before the article is out telling me that you watched. So that's not really what I intended. But thank you for watching at any time, before, after, whenever. I appreciate the time that you allocate to the things I try to do for beekeeping. So Jim saying I'll see you about four weeks from now with some more ramblings and, and uh, more surprises that I came up to discuss with you. Till then, bye-bye.